Good morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church, Elizabethan, Tennessee. I'm Bill Heaton, lay leader. Glad everyone is here today. If you're a visitor, there's a thing to tear off in the bulletin to fill out and drop in the offering plate, and Pastor Robert will make a personal contact with you. If you're watching online, just call the church, and Robin will set up a visit with Pastor Robert and you and your family. Uh, fellowship after, after uh, service today. It's not the big one, but there's still coffee and juice. Um, and Sunday school, big time going on right now. Um, lots of classes. Teachers are, are ready to teach, and they're having a good time. Don't forget Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, Pastor Robert is uh, doing that now, and um, we're learning a lot of different things. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
Good morning. Let us pray. Almighty God of goodness and mercy, you have led us just as a shepherd leads the sheep. You have led us in order to restore our souls. In our time of worship this day, look with compassion on us and on all the world so that we and all the world would know the goodness of the way of Christ, the mercy of the kingdom through Christ. For he who is crucified and risen he is the good shepherd of the sheep. And all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, Father, Son, Good morning. Will you please stand as you're able and join us on the, our opening hymn, Sing with All the Saints in Glory. You'll recognize the melody. It's on page 702 of our hymnal, or the words are on the screen. Please stand. Now let us affirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed on the screen, also in the hymnal at 882. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. 
Thank you. This time we will have our morning offering and our ushers will come forward to help collect that for us. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for blessing us with this day and with this time of worship. As we have been blessed in so many ways, so now we seek to share that blessing with our church and with the world. Bless the gifts that we give and use them for your kingdom through Jesus Christ. This time, if children would come forward, we'll have a few moments. this do you recognize that it's a toy shoe and it's actually ellie's toy <laughs> shoe i we have a few toys and i i took it this morning because i wanted you to think about the sheep what do you know about a sheep 
Yeah, this one, this one is, and many of them are. Yeah. They do come in other colors, though. What else do you know about a sheep? They're fuzzy. Yeah. They're soft. What? They, they can be snuggly, uh, especially if it's a stuffed animal. This one's not very snuggly. Uh, what's what's that? What, the, they're soft and they're fuzzy because of what? Wool. Yeah. And and so, do you have anything made out of wool? No. No. Well, this is made out of wool. It's 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 really lightweight wool, but it's made out of wool and. That's why sheep are so important. And in the Bible, we read a whole lot about sheep, even though we don't have many sheep around. You can see them if you go out driving in the country sometimes. But they were very important in Jesus' day because of, of the wool, and they were so familiar that he could talk about sheep and people would know what he was talking about. And so one day he says, I am the good shepherd. And the shepherd does what? What does the shepherd do for the sheep? He looks after them. Law watches over them. So, and they take care of them. And what he meant was that we can think of ourselves as like sheep, and he is like our shepherd. He watches over us and wants to take care of us. And that's a really important way to remember God's love for us and for everyone. So whenever you see a sheep, you can think about that. But you're kind of like a sheep, too, because Jesus is the good shepherd of all of us. I'm glad you're here today. It's time for Children's Church. And let me say a prayer, and then you can go. Dear God, we give you thanks for watching over us, for tending us, and through Jesus, our good shepherd, guiding us in the way you would have us to go. In his name we pray. Will you please stand and join us as we sing His Name is Wonderful.
please be seated. Our first scripture this morning comes from 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. The gospel reading comes from the book of John, chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
most of us probably know very little about sheep and shepherds. The closest normally that I will get to a sheep is wearing something made out of wool, which is not a bad choice on this cold April morning. But that image of the Good Shepherd is so ingrained in our mind, in our Christian consciousness, by Jesus' use of it here, by the many places that we see that image used in the Bible, both sheep and shepherds, that it does seem familiar to us. Our ancestors, of course, living much closer to the ground, understood completely, or in a much better way, how important sheep were. This was a major industry in the days of the Bible, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. We understand something of this language of sheep and shepherds. So when we hear that phrase, the good shepherd, we will immediately think of Jesus. Jesus even told a familiar parable about a shepherd who goes in search of a lost sheep. And he gives that idea to us, and that's important enough that we even have one of our windows that has that as its theme. This striking metaphor that is, it's the third window on the, that side if you're looking. Y'all just have to wait till later. This, this image that Jesus used, I am the good shepherd, stands out. There are several images or there are several statements that Jesus make which start out this way, I am. They're found in the Gospel of John. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I hear. I am the good shepherd. The work of the shepherd is then detailed by Jesus in this a parable, but it's certainly a, an illustration that he gives to the disciples talking about that relationship that he has with his people. And as I told the children, all of us are to consider ourselves as part of this flock, these sheep of the good shepherd. And because of that, we ought to hear Jesus, who is our shepherd. And during this Easter season, there are some important ideas that we want to remember Jesus shares with the disciples. Of course, this and everything that we read is tied to the resurrection of Jesus Christ to give us new life. And that characterization is found here as Jesus describes a way of us thinking about that new life as by being thought of as sheep with a good shepherd. We know that Jesus is concerned with the world. In John's Gospel, we learn that the reason for Jesus' coming was because of the world, because God so loved the world. That is why Jesus came. That was his purpose on coming to earth. Of course, Jesus comes to the world as it is. And as we have come through those days of Holy Week not too long ago, we know that the consequence of Jesus' coming is dealing with human sin, which we all contribute to in our own ways, which was the reason for Jesus' death. But far from that death as being the result of sin, Jesus' death becomes the means by which sin is overcome. That's clear in the resurrection. The resurrection is not just what happens next to Jesus, but it's an essential part of the completion of the death of Jesus because death is then put 
and sin is put to death on the cross. And that becomes the gateway for us to this new life. Jesus will say, I am the gate to this new life. I am the resurrection. I am the life. Jesus will explain this even more when he tells the disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And all of these I am statements that Jesus is making found in the Gospel of John are distinctive ways of describing the kingdom of God. And this kingdom is most clearly explained in terms of new life that we are given. And so here, Jesus compares that new life to being part of the flock of the good shepherd. Now to think of a, a, a flock of sheep, and there, there's some place that I drive by most every week and I see some sheep on a hillside. To think about being part of a flock of sheep is to be firmly tied to the ground. You may know sheep eat grass and eat it in great quantities, so much so that you can put sheep on a hillside and they will keep the grass under control. God makes us like those sheep in our world. We have responsibility, we have things that we have to do, but sometimes things go wrong. And so Jesus comes to deal with that sin. His dealing with sin is very costly, like a prowling wolf seeking sheep. Sin looks for an opportunity and will find it unless the good shepherd intercedes. And so Jesus says that that's what the shepherd will do, even at the cost of his own life. But it's a willing sacrifice. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Because this is God's agenda and Jesus is the instrument. He is the Son of God, and so he can say, I lay my life down in order to take it up again. Jesus is always in control. And this, the resurrection that we celebrate at Easter and that we celebrate through an Easter season and always when we gather as part of the church is knowing that Jesus has done so much to bring us into this new life or into his pasture, into his place where he watches over us. Jesus, who once was dead, is now alive in order to watch over the sheep. Our first hymn made that illustration in one of the lines of the music, but then it also said something about earth's closing thunder, meaning that there are things that we have to deal with ourselves as part of of the flock of the good shepherd, like, like sheep who have their reason for being kept, we have reason for being part of God's flock. Our job is not to eat grass, but it is to do other things. And this promise that Jesus gives us of watching over us, of guiding us, of caring for us, is so that we are then enabled to do all of those things that Jesus expects his flock to do while we remain on earth, living according to his will, in his love, remaining faithful by hearing the voice of the good shepherd. Now, if you, if you were following along in the scripture, you notice that Jesus not only said, I am the good shepherd once, he said it twice. And the second time he says it, he adds something to it. I am the good shepherd, I know my own, and my own know me. Whenever you see a phrase like, I am the good shepherd, repeated a second time in pretty close proximity to the first time, that means, pay attention, this is important. The sheep continue to hear and know the voice of the good shepherd. That's part of being sheep. Now, sheep, being the, the dumb animals that they are, 
figure this out really easily. Human beings, I don't know whether to say we're dumber or we're smarter because sometimes we don't listen to Jesus like a sheep would listen to a shepherd. See, far from our faith being part of just entering the fold and then doing whatever we want, forgetting about anything else, sheep don't function as a flock unless they continue to hear and to hear the voice of the shepherd. The shepherd tends the sheep, leading them where they need to go. Part of that's his voice. Part of that is his guiding them. The sheep know this. And we know this. How many times have you called to mind those familiar words of the 23rd Psalm, which is a psalm about a shepherd? He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still water. This is what the shepherd does for the sheep. But if you read that psalm and you know this, life is not all pleasant meadows. Life is not all holidays by the lake. Sometimes the shepherd must lead the sheep into some tough places. Some places where they may not want to go. To the darkest valley. A valley of deep darkness. A gloomy valley. The valley of the shadow of death. These are all different translations of that line. For us rod and the staff of comfort are the voice and the words of Jesus who we hear from scripture and it's the power of the Holy Spirit whom Jesus will call the comforter and the spirit of truth if we listen and we must listen because we have to go in these hard places Jesus will lead us there sometimes so, so far from thinking we just lie down in pleasant places and be lazy, the good shepherd leads us in places to go. That's in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, Jesus will tell his disciples, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. The world can be a tough place. You know that. We all understand the hard places of the world. And sometimes those are not just places far off. Sometimes those are, are places where we find ourselves before we know it in a hard and difficult place. We need to be careful then as sheep. Jesus adds one more element to what it means to be Part of this flock. It means that we recognize the importance of being together. Sheep are not meant to be solitary animals. That's one of the big differences. You, you know the phrase, the lone wolf. Wolf will go off on his own, but sheep are meant to be together. It's striking that, that Jesus makes this part of his sacrificial ministry. He says, I lay down my life for the sheep. But then immediately next, he says, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. To bring these, these other sheep in is to know that Jesus is willing to give himself for their sake too. Who are these other sheep? I'm sure the disciples were wondering about that. If you ask the disciples, they would probably point to us and say, those are other sheep. The disciples and the church that, that begins in Jesus' name is a Jewish Christian organization. Jesus collected Jewish disciples. 
they knew and understood themselves as sheep of the household of God because the Old Testament is full of those images of sheep and shepherds. But Jesus makes it clear right here, not just them. He adds this important note because there's not just one fold of sheep, one group of sheep, but there are other folds, other groups, and Jesus claims them too. So very on, in the early life of the church, these disciples and others like Paul came to understand that Gentiles could be part of the sheep of the Good Shepherd. People who did not grow up in the Jewish faith, who did not grow up reading the law or offering sacrifices or keeping feasts like the Passover, people who did not daily recite Deuteronomy 6.4, who did not hold to the purity and dietary laws. Now some of these early Christians who were Jewish, they had a hard time with some of this. But Jesus brings others in. And Jesus is always seeking to bring others in. That's why the church is in essence a missionary enterprise. That's why the church has gone to all of these far-flung places of the world. And why we know as part of the, the, the household of God, part of the flock of sheep, people who look so different from us, who speak languages that we don't understand, who, who dress in ways that, that are different from our ways. They're, they're different people, but they are still part of the flock. Jesus is always seeking these out. Now, yes, Jesus seeks those individual sheep who, who stray from time to time. That's why he told that parable. But there are also those who are outside the normal fold that we're comfortable with and familiar with that Jesus would claim, even to the point of leading us in strange and unfamiliar places, places that we might call dark and dangerous is for us, just like those disciples, to consider just who are these others and recognize that if Jesus is welcoming them, welcoming them as part of the flock, then we must as well. Because the good shepherd always seeks to bring in sheep. Jesus is the good shepherd of the church. Jesus expects the church to be in the same nature of seeking and welcoming others rather than, than condemning our community and the world, we should be looking at the world as Jesus looked on the world. Now, sometimes that's hard. There's a, there's a verse of Scripture. It's found in Matthew and in Mark. When Jesus looked at the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. A few years ago, well, more than a few, several years ago now, before he was elected bishop, William Willimon was minister to the university at Duke University. One day, he was walking across the campus yard in front of the, the chapel, and the, the, the chapel at Duke University is a 210-foot tall building that's a magnificent gothic style church went by there every day myself when I was there it just so happened that this particular day was in the fall and the university was celebrating Oktoberfest so strewn all across the yard in front of the chapel were all kinds of students not in class but having a good time and Dr. Williman saw these students and he was he was accompanied by a friend of his Dr. Stuart Henry Dr. Henry was the professor of American Christianity at the Divinity School he was from Mississippi he never showed up in class if he was not wearing a black suit. And one 
day he showed up wearing a red tie and apologized for it because he usually wore a black tie. He was that formal. So here these two were walking across, and, and as, as, as Bishop Williman described it later, there were all kinds of students in varying states of dress and sobriety. Oktoberfest, after all. And he must have made some sort of a negative comment. But Dr. Henry stopped him and reminded him of that verse of Scripture. How we need to look on those, as Jesus did, with compassion. As sheep without a shepherd, because sheep need a shepherd. To those, there, there are those many in our world that we don't see eye to eye with, that we disagree with, and sometimes we disagree with strongly. That sometimes is all we can see. Cringe every four years now because we get into this political process and there's so much name calling, and so much division among people, and so much, let's just say it, hatred being expressed. We are reminded that is not how Jesus looks on our world. Instead, Jesus looks on the world as a good shepherd who knows and cares for his sheep, who might be in many folds, but they are his sheep. Even when those sheep see themselves as very much different, Jesus has compassion, and he calls on us to have compassion. Jesus willingly gives his life for the sheep. First John reminds us we're called to do the same. Those of us who willingly accept the leadership and the lordship of Jesus are of his flock. And that means that we are called to see the world in the same way that Jesus does, not with hatred, but with compassion. Not with making divisions, but with making welcome. Not with barriers, but with connections. Not with walls, but with gates. This Jesus, who is crucified and risen, the Lord of the church, the shepherd of our souls, the one who is the way, the truth, the life, the resurrection, the gate, the good shepherd, calls to us, knows us, and we hear his voice. May we listen to his voice. And then may we love as Jesus loved, in truth and in action. Jesus, you are our shepherd and redeemer. You are full of compassion and love for the world. As you have given yourself for the world, may we give ourselves completely into the kingdom that you have made real. The kingdom you compared to one flock and one shepherd. Forgive our ways of division and distrust. Forgive our faithlessness our willful ignorance, and our stubborn spirits. Fill us with the knowledge of your grace for us and for others so that we may be the sheep of your flock and the people of your kingdom. Look with compassion on our needs and the needs of others. In confidence, we know that we may lift up to you the concerns that are on our hearts the needs that we see around us, the way in which we see so many people struggling and suffering who are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd, people whose lives are torn by hardship and difficulty, war and terror, who do not know where they will find a place of refuge, or even to sleep. We pray for these.
those who are young, for those who are old, for all of those who are in between, for those who find themselves in situations beyond their control, not only in the far places of the world, but places that are so close to home. Let us not forget these. And let us remember as well how you call us to be one flock together here as your people, to be a church dedicated to knowing you as our Lord and Savior and to proclaiming your goodness to those around us. Help us to see beyond anything that may divide us and into the kingdom where you have called all to be, where you are the one shepherd that we turn to, that we rely on, where the Spirit guides us if we listen, where the Spirit comforts us and helps us to comfort each other. Be with the needs that we bring before you, the ones that are on our hearts. We remember those who have experienced loss, those who are suffering, those who are sick, those who are struggling, those who simply have choices to make in their lives and who need to know your guidance and direction in whatever it is that we do. Help us to trust that you will be there for us, that your rod and staff comfort us, and that you lead us where we need to go as long as we hear your voice and trust in what you do. We lift up all of the prayers of our hearts this day and join our words with the words that you have taught all of your faithful to say together when we offer our prayers to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Please stand for our closing hymn, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us.
Jesus interrogates Peter. Three times he asks Peter, do you love me? And Peter says what? Do, do you, Jesus says, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, you know I love you. He asks him three times. And three times Jesus says to him, feed my sheep. Do you love Jesus? Then you tend to and feed and help and console and care for all those other sheep whom Jesus loves. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace.